Welcome back to another fun with Lagrangian's mini-series. Uh, in the next few episodes, we're going to take a look at the problem of a marble rolling around in a bowl. So you can probably envision this pretty well. You have a bowl, a hemisphere here. Uh, you've got a marble that's allowed to roll inside of it under the influence of gravity. You can already imagine all the fun patterns that it's going to create. Um, the first thing we'll need to do, of course, is establish a coordinate system. I'm going to write this probably a little bit differently than most textbooks uh, just because we have uh, <clears throat> I'm going to write this just a little bit differently compared with most textbooks because I want to be able to port this over to vPython uh, and vPython defaults to y going up so usually in an upper level physics textbook it's z that goes up and x and y form the the plane that is uh, that is independent of gravity there. Um, but just to make it easier to animate, we'll just switch it so that Z is coming out this way and Y is going up this way. Obviously the physics is still the same because the coordinate system is something we as humans add on. And anything we as humans add on needs to go away by the end of the problem. We're gonna put the origin 0, 0, 0 here at the center of the circle at the top of that hemisphere. So. Uh, it's a point that the marble's never going to get to. The reason we do that is so that as this marble slides around in the bowl, the magnitude of its position vector is always the same. It always has the same capital R distance from that center point, right? That way we can easily encode that constraint of the motion that the ball has to roll on the surface of the bowl. Well, that means it's going to have a constant distance from this point, so we're going to make that the origin. Pause. <clears throat> so to build a position vector, uh, this marble has a position vector of xx hat plus yy hat plus zz hat. You can always start with that. Uh, some problems it might be easier to write it differently, but we can always start with that and then work in Cartesian coordinates at least to start out with. So the Cartesian coordinates are nice. We like them because the x hat, y hat, and z hat are uniform and constant. They don't change depending on the point you're at. But it does make working in a sphere here a little bit uh, uh. <clears throat> So Cartesian coordinates are nice because the x hat, y hat, and z hat, they always point in the same direction no matter where you are in the problem. Uh, but we want to be able to express these in terms of these angles theta and phi as we are rolling around uh, inside the bowl here. So we're going to put in here uh, for x, we're going to put in r sine theta cosine phi. For y, we're going to put in r sine theta sine phi. And for z, we're going to put in r cosine theta. So those are kind of the standard um, the, uh, coordinate transformations to go from, uh, from Cartesian to spherical and back again um, with our theta defined as coming off of the x, excuse me, coming off of the z axis and our phi is being defined uh, how we go around in the, uh, in the xy plane there. So we want to take a derivative of this. So theta and phi are both functions of time. Those are the two angles that are changing as the ball rolls around in the bowl. Um, X hat, y hat, z hat are constant, right? They're not changing depending on your position. This is why we like uh, Cartesian coordinates. <clears throat> so we've got a few product rules to do, right? Because I have a function of time, function of time, function of time, function of time. And then fortunately, just one function of time here. So the product rule for the x component is going to change this sign into a cosine. And then it's going to change this sign, and excuse me, going to change uh, this cosine into a negative sign here. Um, and then, of course, we need to pop out the time derivative of each of the uh, variables theta and phi. That's the chain rule going on. So we've taken the derivative of the outside. Now we take the time derivative of the inside. Once you get to that point, you're done. Because um, each of these need to have units of radians per second, right? Radians per second here, radians per second here. For the y component, it goes very similar. We don't end up with a negative here. That'll be important in a minute. Um, so that you end up with cosine sine and then sine cosine. So we get the uh, sort of the mismatch uh, between the two. Again, it's going to spit out a theta dot. It's going to spit out a phi dot. Very important there because that's the thing that's actually changing is, is these two uh, angular speeds here. And then lastly, we've got the z component. Cosine is just going to become negative sine, spit out a theta dot. There you go. So in order to build a Lagrangian, we need, of course, the kinetic energy first. So we're going to take one half m v squared. So v squared is going to be the dot product of r dot with r dot here. And so we've got quite a bit of multiplication to do. So each one of these 
uh, sets of coordinates here is going to give us a different FOIL problem due. Remember with the dot product, you've got x hat dot y hat equals zero, y hat dot z hat equals zero, z hat dot x hat equals zero. So even though it looks like you've got five terms times five terms, it really doesn't end up being quite that many because it's only the x's that get mashed together, it's only the y's that get mashed together, and then it's only z that mashes together with itself. And so for example, when I take this x component here and dot it with itself, I have one FOIL problem, right? I have this term and this term. So I'm gonna do the first term, that's gonna square this piece here. I'm gonna have the last term, that's gonna square this piece here. And then I have the cross term. So the cross term is where everything gets mixed together. So in true foiling fashion, it's gonna be two times just everything put together. So cos theta, cos phi, sine theta, sine phi, cos theta, cos phi, sine theta, sine phi, and then the two dots, the theta dot and the phi dot. There's a theta dot and the phi dot. I ended up with a negative just because there's a negative on one of the two, right? So this is just like when you're doing a plus b times a plus b, you get a squared plus b squared plus 2ab, right? Here's the first thing squared, the second thing squared plus 2ab. Well, except it's really a minus b squared because now we have a, a negative there in the middle. And then you do the same thing with the y's, right? You're going to get the first term squared, the second term squared, and then the cross term. The interesting thing about these two cross terms is that they're exactly the same, right? I have a two, I have a cosine theta, I have a cosine phi, I have a sine theta, I have a sine phi, I have a theta dot, I have a phi dot. The only difference is one's positive and one's negative. So this happens a lot in physics where a cross term is gonna cancel out. It's a thing you can look for because it's a nice symmetry of the problem. So those two, the two longest terms, they go away, right? That's why it's always worth persevering through the, uh, through the algebra that's long to write because something's gonna cancel out. Oh yeah, and then there's the z component. We're gonna take this sine and square it. Gonna take the theta dot and square it. And I am actually missing a theta on there. So let me go in and draw that really quick. This is supposed to be a theta. There we go, there's your theta. And now we start to look at these things and whenever you have a bunch of sine squares and cosine squares in the same thing being added together, you wanna to look for that trig identity where sine squared plus cosine squared equals one if they're of the same thing. For example, uh, these two green squiggle underlines here, they both have a cos squared theta, a cos squared theta, a theta dot squared, and a theta dot squared. The thing they differ on is cos squared theta and sine squared theta. So you're taking cos squared, excuse me, phi, cos squared phi plus sine squared phi. So you're taking cos squared phi plus sine squared phi will give you one, no matter what phi is that combination is always equal to one. So these two just combine to give you whatever's left over because you have a cos squared theta and a theta dot squared. That's what those two green squiggle, squiggle underlines give you. For the pink squiggle underline, uh, you can see that they've both got a sine squared theta and they differ on whether they have a sine squared phi or a cosine squared phi, and then they both have a phi dot squared. So for this thing, we're gonna get sine squared theta times phi dot squared because the sine squared phi and the cosine squared phi, again, they combine to give you one. Uh, and then lastly here, we've got this sine squared theta, theta dot squared. Well, that doesn't really have anything interesting in it until I realize that here I've got cosine squared theta and here I've got sine squared theta. And so if I combine those two together, I just get theta dot squared. So these two green things and this blue thing all combine together just to give me theta dot squared. Right, there will always be some sort of sine squared plus cosine squared equaling one in these problems. Because the thing is, the physics should be simple, right? The end result should be simple, mathematically elegant. And that's what you're doing. You're getting to that mathematically elegant part. So I end up with a theta dot squared and a phi dot squared that's modified by sine squared theta just because, you know, theta is this special axis there. So you're always going to have some trig function of it left over. And that's it for the kinetic energy. All that work to get this. Uh, pretty simple result here for the kinetic energy. There might be a simpler way to do that uh, using spherical coordinates. I just always jump into the Cartesian because the hats are consistent. Um, you can also do this with spherical coordinates if you're willing to take a time derivative of the unit vectors themselves. <coughs> Anything? <clears throat> Let's move on now to the potential energy. Potential energy, it seems to always go simpler than the kinetic energy because this is just gravity. It's just negative mgy. I'm putting a negative on there to explicitly say that, that we're going down this way with the, with the y-axis. So we'll have an mgr sine theta sine phi because you're just plugging in y here as r sine theta sine phi. 
So now we can put together our Lagrangian. We take T minus V. We're going to have our kinetic energy here minus our negative potential energy. It gives me a plus sign over here. And so that's it. That's the Lagrangian uh, for this problem. Next, we get to work on Lagrange's equations, right? So we have to take several partial derivatives of this thing up here. The first step is to take partial of L with respect to theta. So we're looking for everywhere there is a theta. Again, not a theta dot. Theta dot and theta are two completely different variables in this case. We treat them as independent uh, because that's what it means to do a partial derivative. So there are two places I have a theta. I have a sine squared theta here and I have a sine theta in here. So when I take a derivative here with respect to theta, I've got to first do the power rule. So we're going to drop a two here. That's going to cancel out with the half here. Uh, I leave that with a sine theta. Now I've got to take the interior derivative. Derivative sine is cosine and everybody else just comes along for the ride, right? Everything else you just treat as constant. Plus, now I take a derivative of this thing. Again, sine theta is going to become cosine theta over here. So I've got a piece that came from the kinetic energy and a piece that came from the potential energy. Um, next, we look for derivative with respect to theta dot. This one's even easier because there's only one theta dot, right? There's, there's only one here. So again, we drop the two here. I'm going to cancel that with a half. So I'll have an mr squared theta dot. There are no theta dots in the potential energy term. So that just goes away. And then now we finally put them together into Lagrange's equation. I have to take a time derivative of this second one that I had. Well, M and R are both constants. Remember, we chose our origin such that that R, the magnitude of the position vector, is always constant. So we did that strategically so that this theta dot can just become a theta double dot here. No additional dots need to go in on the left-hand side. And then we just set it equal to this piece here, uh, we, noticed, uh, that we noticed here that there's an M and R in both terms, so I just went ahead and factored that out. So it's M times R times this lovely combination in the brackets. So there's our first uh, equation from Lagrange's equation. Now let's repeat the same process, but with phi. So if we go back up to our Lagrangian, I'm looking for anywhere there's a phi. Uh, there is a phi here in the gravitational potential energy term. So I just take derivative of sine, it becomes cosine. Again, everybody else comes along for the ride. And then partial L with respect to phi dot. I'm looking for, hey, there's only one phi dot here. So I'm going to drop the two here. That'll again cancel with the half. You see how it, you, you do end up doing the same steps over and over again. Uh, and so that term ends up looking like this. Now comes the fun part is taking this side's time derivative, right? Because theta is now a function of time and phi dot is a function of time. So I'm going to end up with two terms because I have to do a product rule. So the mr squared just stays there on the outside. When I take derivative of theta with respect to phi dot, this first term, uh, I'm going to drop the two, do an internal derivative, do another internal derivative. So you've got product rule and double chain rules going on. So that's why you practice these in calculus. <clears throat> yep. And then we add the derivative of the next piece. We're going to leave the sine squared alone, and phi dot just becomes a phi double dot. That's why I like the dot notation, because you take a derivative, just add a dot. Uh, and that's going to equal this uh, other term that we came up with uh, from the potential energy here. So there's our second equation. So we've got our two equations of motion. We, in, in, in principle, the problem is solved in the sense that we have a, a pair of differential equations. But now we want to start working on in a term that can go into a code. So I want to solve for theta double dot and I want to solve for phi double dot. Let's do theta double dot first because it looks easier. Literally, we just divide by mr squared. Well, this piece already had an m times an r, so we're just going to divide everybody else by r inside that bracket. So the r here goes away. You're left with a g over r here. Notice there is no mass left over, right? As long as the only force you have is gravity then all the masses should cancel because you'll have a mass coming in from your kinetic energy. You'll have a mass coming in from your gravitational potential energy. Those will cancel. The only time mass survives is when your force doesn't depend on the mass. So like a spring potential energy, or if you want to put in, uh, we can't really do a drag force of Lagrangian per se. I mean, there's other ways to do it, but if you had a drag force, some kind of dissipated force, that usually does not depend on the mass. But anyway, we end up with a theta double dot equals uh, this combination here, um, something that depends on phi dot squared, and then something that comes from the uh, potential energy here. That is now ready to go into the code because I have theta double dot equals this. Solving for phi double dot requires a few more steps because first we've got to move this term over to the right hand side. So that's why you've got this negative two and some other things over here. Notice I left a blank here because that sine theta is about to go away. 
because uh, when we subtract that over there, we've now got to divide by the sine square theta here. Well, that means that this sine theta is going to cancel out. Actually, it means I need a sine theta on the outside, which I have if I zoom out, zoom out. There we go. Uh, I think I originally had my sine thetas in there, and then I just uh, erased them for the, for the sake of convenience. Um, <clears throat> We also are going to need to divide by this MR squared. Again, that's going to cancel with the MR squared uh, over on, well, the MR squared is already over here, so it's going to cancel one of these R's. We're going to put the G over R. You notice you keep ending up with G over R, right? You have a G over R here and a G over R here because that's taking your linear acceleration in meters per second squared and making it into an angular acceleration by canceling out the meters, giving you radians per second squared. And so we end up with this combination that's got g over r cosine phi minus 2 cos theta, theta dot, phi dot, all divided by sine theta. Now that sine theta in the denominator should bother you, right? Because sine can become equal to 0, uh, which is a problem when it's in a denominator. So let's scroll up and let's try to remind ourselves what physically would happen if theta were equal to 0. So for sine theta to equal 0, we've got to have theta equal to 0 or to 180 which means we would be at the edge of the bowl, right? We would be uh, either at this lip of the bowl or you know, somewhere around the lip of the bowl, meaning we're about to leave the bowl. Well, yeah, that's where our model ends. So our mathematics becomes nonsensical where the physical model no longer becomes valid. So that actually works out pretty well for us. We'll just make sure that we don't uh, get a theta equal to zero or 180 uh, when we run our code in the next video.